Okay, we move on to our speaker of the day, Gordon Hamilton. Started uh, his working life as an apprentice for MMA uh, and moved into all circles of aviation, uh, a lifetime of aviation. But what he wants to talk about today is his time with Fiji Airways as a, uh, a travelling engineer. Some of the monkey business he got up to. Uh, the company wasn't as squishy as we would know our airlines today, so he had to perform quite a number of tricks to keep the show on the road. So, Gordon, over to you. Uh, age 23, I went to work for Fiji Airways based in Suva. So I'm a licensed aircraft maintenance engineer. I completed my apprenticeship two years early with our local airline, the Robinson Miller, and had received my licence in the mail on my 21st birthday. Part of the job description with Fiji Airways included travelling engineers' duties, and this meant being part of the air crew and looking after the aircraft such as fuel, oil, fixing defects along the way. And as we took up space, we also looked after the well-being of the self-loading freight, serving meals, refreshments to them and the crew. So uh, I've done a little bit of research into the history up there and there was a Fiji Airways um, that was set up in, um, back by Guinea Airways and established in Adelaide, South Australia in 1932. And it began a short-lived um, Fijian service in March the following year. Uh, in its first 10 weeks of operations, one of its uh, general aircraft company, uh, Geneco Open Biplane aircraft, had been sunk in Suva Harbour uh, whilst undergoing a government directed loading test. <laughs> uh, and they managed to lose um, 1,500 pounds that the government had um, granted them, and they, uh, the business was wound up in March 1934. And there's information on that, you can find on the website about that. Okay, that's, uh, that was the uh, out of the Fijian Civil Register, just listing the aircraft. The, um, the second aircraft there, the Dornier, that's in a museum in Germany, I believe. Now, Fiji Airways number two, uh, Harold Gatti, uh, a famous Tasmanian aviator dubbed the Prince of Navigators by Charles Lindbergh established the second airline called Fiji Airways in September 1951. Harold Gatti is worthy of a session dedicated purely to his achievements and I'll briefly just touch on stuff here. He had flown to fame with American Wiley Post in their, in their 1931 circumnavigation of the globe in Winnie May, a Lockheed uh, Vega aircraft. He then helped Pan Am Airways set up their South Pacific routes um, pre the Second World War. And after World War II, Gaddy relocated uh, with his Dutch-born wife to Fiji. He's credited with inventing an air sextant, which uh, used a spirit level to provide an artificial horizon. He also uh, invented an aerochronometer, which offset inaccuracies introduced in the observations taken in the moving plane and the most important invention of his career was the Gatti drift site. Um, Harold Gatti introduced the uh, the Weems system of navigation to the US Army Air Corps uh, starting in 1932 uh, when he served as a civilian instructor and a technical advisor. Harold Gatti passed away, I, I believe, from a stroke on the 30th of August in 1957, aged 54. Qantas had bought Fiji Airways from uh, the widow of Harold Gatti in 1957. And I, prior to Gatti's passing, I understand there was already a degree of uh, Qantas involvement. There's a book, uh, Fiji Aviation Story, by uh, Kiwi guy Morris uh, McGreal, and it gives a fair bit of detail about the political willing and dealing um, regarding the shareholders at that time. At the end of 1959, as I understand it, uh, shares in the airline were spent th three equal ways between Qantas, representing Australia, and British Airways, uh, Fiji was a British colony, and Teal, 
uh, Air New Zealand. So they were three uh, shareholders. In 1960, Fiji Airways started its international operations flying um, Mark 1 uh, B Herons to Tonga. Uh, these aircraft would leave about 17 knots slower than the Mark 2 Herons, uh, which have the retractable landing gear. Initially, Fiji Airways had used uh, de Havilland uh, Dragon Rapide and drove her aircraft on uh, internal flights. The Fiji Airways first flight was on the 1st of September 1951 uh, in a Dragon Rapide biplane flying from Suva's Nasiri Airport to uh, Drasa Airport near Latoka on the west coast of the main island. The uh, fleet soon included DC-3s and a number of de Havilland Herons uh, were added after acquisition by Qantas and the network spread throughout the neighbouring islands and their first uh, HS-7 parade aircraft uh, VQFAL was introduced into service in the latter half of 1967. After Fiji gained independence from Britain in 1968 the airline then started to offer shares to the other emerging Pacific nations uh, as they gained their independence and I assume that was to ensure their landing rights around the uh, Pacific. They also purchased the name Air Pacific from a small charter operator and also why in uh, 2013 they've gone back to Fiji Airways to more accurately portray who they are. And I won't go any further into the history of Fiji Airways, Air Pacific, because I haven't been back to Fiji since 1970. And I'll just cover a uh, period in 1967 when I was there. Fiji's international routes in 1967 were to Tonga, uh, the New Hebrides, the Solomon Islands, Gilbert and Ellis Islands, and Western Samoa. Some of these places have different names today. Uh, there's Kiribati and um, Tuvalu. And as near as I can determine the sector times for the flights were uh, Nandi Vila was a four hour flight, Villa de Santo, uh, 1 hour 15 minutes, Santo de Honiara, 4 hours 30, and the return was about the same. Uh, except Villa and Andy, they often, with a good tailwind at 9,000 feet, uh, would it be a 3 hour 15 flight. Tarara trips were about 4 hours to Nandi Funafuti, and 4 hours 45 onto Tarara. Uh, the return trip was about 5 hours 15 plus. Uh, due to trade winds. And um, these flight times are uh, in the Mark II Herons. So the flights took two days to reach Honiara or Tarawa and one day to return to Fiji. Uh, so a three day operation, with the third day being about a 13 hour duty day. And to top it off, uh, as far as I can remember, cabin seats didn't recline. Uh, the Tonga flights were done using DC 3s and uh, there weren't as much fun as the other trips there and back in the same day. Uh, Western Samoa flights were uh, in the Mark II Herons and without engineers. Um, in the mid-50s, Fiji Airways took delivery of five drovers. They'd all been part of the seven originally ordered and allocated to Qantas for their PNG operations. And unfortunately, the, the driver aircraft had some design problems associated with the propellers. And in fact, I understand Qantas's last complete hull loss and fatal accident was in July uh, 1951, uh, when a driver, uh, it's VH EBQ, ditched into the sea inbound to Ley uh, in New Guinea, with the loss of the captain and six passengers. Originally blamed on pilot error for continuing the flight uh, Canadian VFR flight in low cloud and rain. But uh, the wreckage was later salvaged and an investigation established that uh, a propeller blade on the centre engine had, had failed and it, the engine had been pulled out. Uh, the chosen hair screw that you have on two bladed uh, variable pitch metal propeller proved to be the Achilles heel of the new aircraft type. Uh, the seven Qantas drivers were all Mark 1s, but after the accident, the remaining six were modified to Mark 1Fs uh, with the fitting of uh, Ferry Reed fixed pitch propeller. Qantas actually refused to take delivery of their 
the last two of their seven aircraft. Um, and later the five uh, remaining were sold to Fiji Airways by Qantas and they're all modified further to Mark IIs uh, with the installation of double slotted flaps. And that included the two that Qantas had refused to take. Now two of the five were written off pretty early in their life with Fiji Airways. In both instances the aircraft were, were flown by the chief pilot at the time, but at different pilots. <laughs> Um, the first one uh, was in August 1954 and it was after one month in service uh, and the force landed on a reef following some fuel system handling problems and the pilot and seven passengers were okay but the aircraft was recovered uh, by barge but having been swamped by the incoming tide uh, was written off due to the saltwater immersion. Uh, another driver and FAQ after about six months of service took off from Missouri Airport uh, about 8 a.m. one morning on the 30th of December it was, 1955, was never seen in the skies again. Uh, the pilot, the only person on board, extracted himself from the wreckage and started to walk out of the jungle till he was found by a local out on a wild pig hunt. Uh, he'd managed to clip a tree while flying low across a gorge and um, somebody suggested to me that there was a bit of aerial prospecting going on at the, <laughs> the time. Uh, another one, uh, FOP managed to tear out the port engine and landing gear on a taxiing accident uh, due to a brake failure. Uh, the guy that was flying that later went on to be one of their chief pilots. Uh, and that was after, after landing. And, but that aircraft was rebuilt and eventually sold uh, to TA and ferried back to Australia. Uh, another one of the aircraft, um, FAS, was operated for about five years before it had been leased to the New Hebrides Airways uh, in mid-1961, where it eventually retired when it ran out of spa life. The fifth aircraft was um, FAR, and it was in pieces in the back of the hangar when I arrived uh, in Fiji in 1967. The story, I believe, um, is that a lot of time and money had been spent refurbishing this aircraft. And the lady running the project had left Fiji. So another lady was put in charge. And then one of the apprentices found uh, large amounts of corrosion growing on the main spar, uh, sufficient to make it un uneconomical to make the aircraft airworthy. So engineering management, looking for a scapegoat, blamed the lady uh, for putting battery acid on the spa. <laughs> now I, I do know this particular lady and not f for one minute do I believe the management side of the story but that was the end of that bloke in Fiji. The apprentice, uh, now retired lady uh, living in Brisbane uh, told me back in uh, August 2014 of his involvement in the process. The aircraft was eventually given to the local tech school as a training aid and I believe it was subsequently washed away down the, uh, the river in a flood in, in the early 1970s. Actually the boys showed us the flood level on the hangar wall when we went to work there. Uh, now the Heron fleet, uh, this information was provided to me by uh, Captain Russ Hilda, and he's retired, due in Perth next week. Uh, first went to Fiji as a lamey in 1959, uh, but initially not to work for Fiji Airways. The uh, Fiji Airways had three Mark 1B Herons, and these aircraft had uh, been operated from new by NAC uh, in New Zealand in the beginning of the 50s. And you'll probably know that the uh, number one, the prototype of the Heron was at uh, Paul Creek Museum. No, I don't believe it's there anymore. Uh, the Heron had evolved out of the Dove, and in fact, Dove outer wing panels were initially used on the Heron. <coughs> and the, the initial, the, uh, the Mark I Heron had fixed undercarriage and they just patched over the, uh, the wheel well holes. Um, two of those aircraft, FAL and FAX, as they became, went to Southern Airlines from New Zealand uh, in about 1957. 
Qantas had bought Fiji Airways from Harold Gaddy's widow in 57. And when Southern Airlines fell over, Qantas bought the Herons, refurbished them, and sent them to Fiji in about 1958. Uh, FAY uh, was purchased a couple of years later direct from New Zealand. The next two aircraft were Mark IIs, uh, and they'd come from India and was in such poor state of the fabric that uh, the pilot apparently avoided any cloud all the way from India to uh, Sydney. And there it's suggested that the chief engineer, uh, out of sight of the uh, welcoming uh, photographers, went round and punched his fist through much of the flap and ailerons as he could. Obviously didn't want them in that condition up in Fiji. Uh, I think they were Mark II Cs. The last two were two, uh, Mark II Ds and uh, they'd come from Spain. So the feathering props and they all had the 250 horsepower uh, Gypsy 30 Mark II engines. So along the line um, one of the Mark I Herons was written off by a Polish pilot who panicked in bad weather and dumped it on a, a disused strip on a, an island, um, Tabiuni, in uh, December 1965. Uh, so it overran the short strip. There were 17 POB, but uh, no injuries. Another one, uh, FAX, was scrapped following an accident uh, in November 66 and became fire practice at the southern end of the, the, the Surrey grass strip. And the, the third one, FAY, was the only Mark 1B uh, operating by the time I went to Fiji in 67. It, it uh, was eventually operated in New Zealand for a while and it's now in a museum uh, with its original New Zealand registration. Uh, Two of the Mark IIs, I believe, um, came to Australia and operated in the Bass Strait area, but they were um, modified um, with Lycoming engines. And one's in a museum in uh, Calandra. A bit of uh, tech info you may be interested in. The, the 1Bs had a max um, all-up weight of um, 13,150 pound, but Fiji Airways operated them internally at uh, 12,500 pound. Uh, because of strip limitations and commercial pilot uh, limitations. Uh, the Mark IIs had an all-up weight of um, 13,500 pounds. And somebody decided the only difference structurally were extra skin stiffeners in board of the wheel area. And Fiji Airways put these stiffeners into the Mark I-Bs and then operated them uh, overseas on, uh, at 13,500 pounds. And uh, once all the senior pilot, the pilots had um, either senior commercials or uh, ALTPs. However, it was found that the spar life dropped from 20,000 hours down to 15,000 hours, and the boffins had to recalculate the spar lives to take into account the time operated overweight. And while well, doing a bit of research, I found out that um, when the Queen of Tonga died in December 1965, the Fijian chiefs. Uh, went on a special flight to Tonga and uh, when they were working out the load they uh, loaded them at 170 pounds each. <laughs> now, you know Fijians? <laughs> the big boys. Yeah, the, the aircraft apparently took 55 minutes to reach top of climb instead of the normal 30 minutes and they later suggested that the takeoff weight, weight was somewhere over 15,000 pounds so it was about um, 1,500 pound overweight plus. So that's your 10%, isn't it? <laughs> uh, now, what I originally wanted to talk to you about was uh, my experience as a travelling engineer with Fiji Airways. Uh, and at first I was a bit insulted that you know, I didn't do all that work to get a licence to, uh, to serve meals to passengers. But uh, after a while I saw the funny side of the business. Our training for this role consisted of jumping fully clothed, less shoes, uh, into the swimming pool at the old um, New Zealand Air Force Base at uh, Lathala Bay. That's uh, just outside of Suva. Uh, we inflated the big old round 10-man raft. 
which was tipped upside down. Uh, we had to right the raft and then clamber aboard. So, totally inadequate training on the emergency equipment, first aid equipment, and serving passengers. In fact, virtually nothing. But all Fiji Airways engineers so trained received their uh, purple and two gold bar uh, epaulets. So we had them wearing those around, and they're senior flight engineer stripes. So it's a bit embarrassing when we were um, sort of walking through Nandi Airport, and you, you walk through there and you come across a flight engineer who's just arrived on a Boeing 707 or a DC-8 with only one gold bar, and he asks you what, what aircraft you're off. Yeah, so. <laughs> We were using on, on these international services in those days the, the Mark II Herons. So it's with a retractable undercarriage, feathering props. And we're still operating the one uh, Mark I on the internal flights. But my, my first trip as crew was with uh, like Captain Russ Helder. And the first officer's name was Terry Shepard. And I remember the captain well. And he recently told me who the FO was. Uh, we were bound for Honiara on Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands via an overnight stop in Port Vila in the New Hebrides and then on to Honiara via Santo also in the New Hebrides. Now we engineers in Fiji Airways had been warned about Captain Hilda by the other Lamies and my mate Neil had already crossed paths with him a few weeks earlier uh, on the afternoon tarmac duties. Now, the captain didn't talk to me when the crew car picked me up early in the morning to take us to Nasiri Airport, other than to confirm it was my first trip. N not that I was very talkative in those days. Uh, we positioned the aircraft in Andy Airport, picked up our few passengers. Can't remember how many, but uh, we couldn't carry many in a heron uh, as they were configured for the international flights. So about an hour or so out of Nandi, uh, for Port Vila, I figured it, it must be time for refreshments. So as I said, no training in uh, passenger service. So I wandered up to the front, and the heron stepping over the spar. <coughs> and uh, we had no cockpit door installed in that configuration. And I asked the captain if he'd care for a drink. They granted yes. What would you like? Coffee? How would you like it, captain? Strong and black like my women. Right, says I, bastard under my breath, and then headed aft to the galley. The FO says, uh, this is your first trip, I'll come and give you a hand. So I, I was getting the makings out of the galley, the cups, and I was suddenly saying, excuse me, to the FO, and then I ducked back into the toilet area for a technicolor yawn. <laughs> uh, I then returned and proceeded to make the drinks. The captain's coffee was strong and black and I don't think the spoon would fall over <laughs> and uh, I've never made Russ Hilder another cup of coffee. Um, but we're still friends ever since and apparently the FO just went back up the front and said to Russ, what the hell have we got here? <laughs> and they proceeded to tell Russ about me being airsick. He just couldn't go over the fact that I came back from being airsick and then just got on with making the drinks. I mean, what else could you do? I had problems with it being air sick and was known amongst other things as a chundering engineer. <laughs> and uh, I was sick on at least once on every three day trip um, that I'd made in the Herons and often it was just on the final sector uh, into Missouri uh, just to keep my record straight. We overnight in Port Vila and obviously uneventful as I can't remember anything out of the, the ordinary. Uh, that is other than being made to sit in the front of the minibus uh, taking us in, into town because in, being part of French territory they drive on the wrong side of the road and I've just been thinking is we've just had this accident out there on the, the cruise ship passengers uh, with their buses. So the next day two sectors on to uh, Honiara meals and refreshments served OK in the second segment. Everything was fine uh, until just before top of descent into Honiara when Russ signalled me to go up front. And there he told me we had a dead magneto on number two engine to, to be changed once we landed. So after landing, clearing customs, the two pilots buggered off 
saying, just get a taxi into the hotel when you finish. You know, my first time in Honiara to start with, and I've never changed a, a magneto on a Gypsy Queen 30 engine. They're not like the big round engines in the DC-3 that I was more familiar with. We carried a few spares in a box in the rear baggage locker and uh, my toolbox was under my seat uh, alongside the galley. Fortunately, the, the local Navy for Megapode Airways uh, up there until recently had been working in Fiji and uh, Charlie uh, had a lot of experience on the herons. So he took pity on me and gave me a quick lesson on how to do a mag change and then drove me into the hotel. And it was really worth it to see the look on Russ's face uh, when we walked into the hotel lounge. I'm sure that he'd expected me to, uh, that I would stuff it up and would take ages and possibly he'd have to come and, and rescue me uh, if he was also a lady. And uh, it, I may be being unfair to Russ, uh, except that I'm sure he expected me to stuff up. <laughs> This was my first trip and he'd only met me that morning, so he didn't know anything about me. I'm not sure which um, Honiara airfield we used on that trip. Henderson has been developed as the main airport, or whether we went into Cookham. Uh, Cookham, I think, was known as number two uh, fighter strip. And it became part of the local golf course. Um, after about 1970, but um, it was still being used um, depending on, on what uh, Henderson was like. So as far as I can remember, the trip back to Fiji was uneventful except for the uh, thick cloud stuff covering Suva back on the Fiji main, main island, uh, Vigi Levo, and it was getting dark because it was after six o'clock at night. So the guys up front did a good uh, ADF letdown using nearby radio beacons, which were at the uh, New Zealand Air Force Base, the Thala Bay, and we were home. I never did another Heron flight with Russ, but as far as I can remember, uh, he moved on to be the founding director of Air Pacific, and in 1969 he employed me from Jandicott uh, to be his chief engineer, looking after two Beach Barons, a Vic Air Tour, and a Grumman uh, G73 Mallard. So back in those days, every trip had a little drama to make it memorable. Yeah, the Heron, that's the, the uh, Heron cabin. The, the rearmost seats in that picture are mounted over the, the spars. Uh, so you've got to step over that to get up front. Uh, in the top of the picture, the front escape hatch can be seen there. The Heron has three of these overhead hatches. And in Fiji Airways, overseas configuration, we had a sextant mounted through that front uh, escape hatch. Uh, the left hand front seat was replaced with a map table under which we stowed uh, the Gibson Girl emergency radio um, and the right hand front seat was replaced with a modified seat having the uh, left hand armrest removed so the navigator, usually the captain, could sit there and make his plots on the maps on the table. And there was a drift site installed through the fuselage side wall in, in front of the uh, right hand seat uh, again so the captain uh, could, could uh, take drift sightings through the navigation. Uh, the cockpit door that was on there, there pictured open which didn't have one. So that was the reconfigured uh, cabin. Um, Fiji Airways cabins had the uh, net <coughs> overhead for your hand baggage. It's not good design. Um, the Herons, we had um, two ADFs and no other electronic navigation aids. We had the good old magnetic compass, the drift site, and the sexton. So the captain had to shoot the uh, stars and whatever to work out our position. Most of the positions did not have anything more than a radio beacon. Uh, and this is pre-DMA in that part of the world, except probably Nandy Airport. Um, what was interesting that, that most of the airports we used had been built uh, by the American Seabees in uh, 1943 as part of the war in the Pacific. And they'd used cr crushed coral, uh, 
uh, which was dredged up just offshore <coughs> and then sprayed with seawater. It was rolled and compacted and set like concrete. Uh, apparently the coal stayed uh, together long enough to bind. I'm told that these strips were well equipped with the latest uh, navigation aids at the end of the war uh, and with lighting. However, at the end of the war it was all ripped out and dumped in the nearby sea. Um, probably somebody didn't want to pay for it. Uh, they dumped a lot of military hardware in the sea as well. The main thing that appears to have survived uh, back in the late 60s was the Marsden matting. Uh, particularly up around Honiara where it appeared to be the universal building material. My last trip into Honiara and Heron was part of a tandem flight. We had too many passengers for one aircraft so Fiji Airways flew two aircraft uh, on the trip and the second Heron carried one of the local Fiji and Indian checking guys as the, uh, as the hostess. I had engineering responsibility for both aircraft. Everything went well for the whole trip except on the third day going home, we were a bit tight for time. Uh, so at Santo, it's always a drama to get engine oil, so I just took a, enough fuel into both the aircraft to, to get us home to Fiji. Because I knew it was easy to get oil at uh, Port Vila. So the other aircraft was only minutes ahead of us into Port Vila, so I quickly topped up uh, the, the oil tanks and sent him on his way. And, um, we were coming a bit fine. Had to get airborne to be on our way to the point of no return through the lack of nav aids out there. So the first three engines, no problems, but on the last engine I had uh, the top off the oil tank and was standing on the wing taking the top off the oil bottle and the top slipped from my fingers and fell straight down into the oil tank. Uh, if I'd aimed I couldn't have, couldn't have done it, wouldn't have happened. The captain actually had his foot up on the step and uh, wanted to know how long I was going to be. And I had to explain because of the design of the oil tank and where the feathering oil supply came from that I couldn't guarantee there wouldn't be a problem if we'd had to feather. So we had to stay overnight. Uh, that was after I'd taken the top out of the oil tank. There was a whole lot of um, 2BA bolts and you know what they are if you've been involved with British aeroplanes. And I was diving my arm down into the hot engine oil up to, you know, well past my elbow to retrieve the drop container lid. I never did find out what the layout of that tank was, so <laughs> don't know. We only had one passenger on the aircraft, that, for, you know, the others were all on the other aircraft. So uh, he and I went out that night visiting the uh, nightlife in Port Vila. And I found out he was an ex Royal Marine and had a connection with the only family that I knew who lived in Coote Street in South Perth. <laughs> it's a pretty long street. Uh, about two years later, I was working on the Air Pacific um, Baron at Nasuri Airport. This bloke came out to fly the Victor Turret. And we realised um, who the other was and reminisced about Port Vila. And he'd asked me if I'd deliberately dropped the, uh, the top of the oil bottle in the, in the tank or was an accident. And I explained it was an accident, and his response was, well, when I tell a story, you did it deliberate. <laughs> so thanks, mate. So another trip, we were heading from Tarawa, Fort Tarawa in the Gilbert Islands, with an overnight stop in Funafuti in the Ellis. And again, it was in the Mark II Heron. Indications from the beginning uh, was that it was not going to be an uneventful flight, because on the pre-flight, uh, I found a note from the tarmac engineer uh, from the previous evening telling me that the dome seal on number two propeller may be leaking and they put a new seal on the prop tools in the rear locker and um, in case it was I could change it at Funafuti in the afternoon after we got there because we had nothing to do after the flight went. I reckon they'd fixed it with a rag spanner the night before and given it a quick engine run and made the decision based on not uh, re reproducing an oil leak in a, about a two minute run. I must have wanted to go home early. The captain was a Selenese bloke, uh, Dion Bennett, uh, who I'd flown with on several occasions. He was a good bloke with a bit of a sense of humour. Uh, we had passengers out in the Surrey to Nandi uh, as we were carrying the British High Commiss Commissioner 
Sir and uh, Lady Foster on this trip. There was also a Fijian woman who turned out to be a nursing sister on her way to Tarawa. In Nandi we had two additional female passengers, one English and the other uh, Gilbertese woman. No real problems. But when I was serving morning tea, I noticed that the, uh, the Gilbertese woman had a handful of picture psalm cards, uh, St. Christopher medals and rosary beads. <laughs> and uh, when I asked if she'd care for a drink, her response was, uh, I don't know, but if God wants me to, I will, so I'll be here, yeah, have a drink. Same response later in the day when I offered her uh, a meal. Uh, so I'd give her the meal. Problems came when we were at top of descent coming in to land at Funafuti because I had to fight her for the uh, meal tray so that I'd get the cabin cleaned up uh, before the landing. And Funafuti is an interesting place to... Uh, the highest point on the main island, I'm told, is at nine feet above sea level. And the strip being built by the Anks in 43, made out of crushed coral uh, down the ocean side of the atoll. Uh, with only a weather station between uh, the strip and the, and the ocean. So that was back in 67. The island, uh, probably about 150 yards and metres wide with some scrub in the hotel, village and lagoon on one side and uh, it widens out at the northern end. And uh, that's where the main village is and uh, there's an old seaplane landing um, area in the lagoon. Um, due to spring tides bubbling up through the runways there is a moss growing on the, on the runway surface and being of crushed coral it slashes skidding tides. So the Fiji Airways pilots used a special landing technique to avoid using the wheel brakes and basically that meant uh, full flap and to hold the nose up high until the aerodynamic braking effect on the aircraft just causes the, uh, the nose to just clunk over. And so it's a bit scary first time you experience it, but after that... And the other thing too, we were coming in over the top of the coconut palms. So once we'd parked the aircraft, uh, we'd no end of trouble getting rid of our Gilbertese passenger um, to depart the aircraft. She kept telling us something terrible was going to happen. Uh, but eventually somebody convinced her that we had to stay overnight or you know, something would happen and she got off the aircraft. So after we checked into the hotel, I changed to some casual working clothes, yeah, shorts and t-shirt, and wandered out of the aircraft and quietly changed the propeller seal. No dramas. But when I uh, opened up the engine at full throttle uh, during the ground run, uh, check for oil leaks, this bloody Gilbertese woman come charging out of the scrub at the side of the, the parking area running at the aircraft. And that's, uh, that's a number two engine running and she was heading straight for it. So I pulled the throttle close, but uh, do you know the Dun and Heron cockpits? Um, not very ergonomically designed. The DV window is very small and you can't get your head out of it. And I was doing my best uh, and suggesting politely the woman might just want to go away. Um, the mag magneto switches are over on the right hand side of the panel and I couldn't reach those uh, to shut it off and the engine fuel cutoffs down behind the back of the seat, the left hand seat, and I couldn't reach those and and uh, I sort of had visions that um, she was going to be sliced up with the propeller and that would have spoiled my day. Yeah, and hers. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Fortunately there was a couple of big Alice Islanders and they dragged her away and um, in reality I probably should have just cut the engine as soon as I saw her running at the aircraft, but I was as green as grass and uh, human factors and training um, hadn't been invented back then. <laughs> so uh, and that, that Heron cockpit, I'm not sure what model that is because it's got um, fire extinguishers and we certainly didn't have engine fire extinguishers. Anyway, after she was taken away, it took two hands to open up the throttle to complete the engine run. And I packed up and wandered over the hotel that only opens once a week on aeroplane day. The rest of the crew were having a quiet drink. And the captain, the Salonese bloke with the ebony skin tones, he takes a look at me and says, what's the matter with you? You've gone white. <laughs> and my normal tropical suntan had disappeared. So I told him uh, what had happened and his comment was, bloody hell, we have to take her with us tomorrow. 
So um, because the High Commissioner's wife were with us, the locals put on a mecky uh, that evening in the village hall. Uh, a big open-sided hut with thatched roof, uh, very impressive. The English, the Fijian and the Gilbertese women um, sh shared the one room that night in the hotel. And they were not too happy in the morning as they not had much sleep. The Gilbertese woman had insisted that they kept the windows and doors closed and the lights on all night and their room must have been like a sauna. So Lady Foster was travelling on with us to Tarot while her husband, the High Commissioner, was staying in Funafuti uh, with the Commissioner from Tarot and he was already there. Uh, usually the passengers wait until we're ready for them to board after we'd completed pre-flight and rev undercarriage locks and etc. But our Gilbert East lady decided uh, she wanted to board as soon as we had the cabin door open. So instead of um, having a bit of a fight with her, we let her board and insisted she sat in the same seat as the day before. And that was okay, she still had her hands full of uh, psalm cards and her St Christopher medals and her rosary beads. So eventually we we take off. So all's well, it's a nice clear day. The, the FO is a Kiwi by the name of Jackson and he was in the left hand seat. So after, after the take off the captain decided to come down the cabin to uh, talk to Lady Foster. So I went up front to sit in the right hand crew seat of, of the Heron. And the Herons are not equipped with autopilots. So I was doing the straight and level stuff and um, Jackson was having a snooze. It was a glorious day with sun streaming through the cockpit windows. Then all of a sudden there's a hand on my left arm and the Gilbertese lady's trying to get into the cockpit with us. <laughs> well, so it seemed. Uh, and I'm not sure what she was yapping on about, but she bothered me. So I slapped Jackson away because I swung my left arm across the doorway to make sure she couldn't join us. And I managed to get her to sit down but she wouldn't go back to her, seat, her original seat and seat herself on the navigation seat, the right-hand front seat of the cabin. The end result of this was the captain was unable to use the sextant or the drift site, but fortunately it was a good day, uh, good weather, and we, uh, we just island hopped on up the chain to uh, Tarawa. Eventually I decided it was time to look after the passengers in my role as hostess. Uh, I'd found out that the English woman uh, was an ex-British army nurse and the, the Fijian woman was a, a nursing sister and they were both on their way to Taro to the hospital to work up there. Um, so there we were with the two nursing sisters and we had a little discussion about our Gilbertese lady who we decided was definitely loopy, a few bricks short of a load. And I asked if we were to give her a shot of morphine from the first aid kit. <laughs> would that have any effect? And the, neither nurse could offer an opinion. But Lady Foster, who looked to me like everybody's grandmother, said, um, give me the fire axe and I'll whack her if she causes any trouble. <laughs> uh, we decided we didn't think um, it got to that stage. So uh, that was all right. Good lady to have a board. Anyway, the captain came back down and instructed me to return to the cockpit because our favourite passenger was calm while I was up front. <laughs> um, so I, I quickly instructed the two nurses on uh, where the makings were in the galley uh, and, and they played hostess while I went back up to the cockpit. And according to the captain, who was a good Catholic, our wayward passenger noted, associated the purple and gold engineering stripes on my shoulders with the Catholic Church. <laughs> and that's why she was happy. Uh, and I won't tell you what nickname that earned me. Uh, and eventually we landed at Tarawa and there was an official welcoming party to meet Lady Foster, including some girl guides and a couple of nuns. And our favourite passenger wouldn't get off the aircraft. And eventually a couple of the girl guides came and talked to her off the aircraft and, and the, the nuns were there to collect this uh, woman and the captain suggested to her that the young lady had a serious mental issue to which they replied it's of the spirit not of the mind end of the issue we found out later that she was a local school teacher who had 
uh, seen the light and decided she wanted to become a nun. So the church had shipped her off to Sydney. You can imagine that from a little adult. And uh, to be training, trained, and uh, she couldn't handle the, the regime and, and she cracked up. So the good old church has bought her a ticket back to Tarot. And the Qantas ground host, he said, in Nandy had found her wandering around the terminal with a ticket for our flight and just stuck her on board. And nobody thought to warn us of the poor woman's uh, health condition. Uh, and this was the, uh, the last of the scheduled heron services into Tarawa. So the captain had done a little beat up on Basio Island at the western end of uh, South Tarawa. And in doing so, he almost cleaned up the radio masts and uh, that would have really spoiled our day. But th that afternoon we got a lift from the hotel, uh, which is at uh, Bariki, uh, um, to the western end, where we got a ride on the Grockler's launch uh, over to uh, Basio. Uh, this was to visit a friend of the captain's, who was a colonial policeman. We were then invited to a boat launching ceremony, which is a pretty big deal for the Gilbertese. And from there we were invited to a christening of a first grandchild, uh, also a pretty big deal for the Gilbertees. And we joined in the feasting. We managed to get the last launch back to Bariki. Uh, somewhere around about midnight, we were sitting in the police station while they got fuel for the police Land Rover so they could drive us back down the island chain to the hotel. So the three of us were not feeling too flash next morning uh, at breakfast. Uh, when the captain got the weather report, he decided the winds were too strong, so we all went back to bed. <laughs> and uh, an hour or so later, there was an obnoxious yank making a lot of noise about having to get to Nandy that night. And we had to get going. So the captain had a look at the revised weather forecast and decided the winds were now old and sufficient for us to, to depart, but we were not going to get past Furniferty anyway. Uh, running out of daylight problems. So we, we got going, but had to stay overnight in Funafuti, as predicted. And the Yank Passion had been doing some research around the South Pacific Islands into sick breadfruit trees. And that evening we joined the two commissioners for dinner, and they de demonstrated great diplomacy, as this Yank kept on ranting about his studies and what he'd found. And he was blaming the overwater privies um, for fouling the areas where the breadfruit tried. Now the overwater privies are the local toilets and they're like a phone booth perched at the end of a very rickety narrow jetty out in the lagoon. So they're tide indicators really. High tide, you know you get splashed and for low tide it's splat and then it all gets flushed out into the lagoon. Anyway the rest of the flight back to Fiji was pretty uneventful. You could say it's been hazardous but entertaining. Now with the refueling, we always refueled on arrival and uh, in a lot of places the refueling was um, out of drum stock in places like Funafuti and Tarawa. Uh, often so old that the dye had come out of the fuel so instead of red 80, 87 it, it was clear. We didn't take too much notice of the dates on the drums but we did try to use the oldest drums first. And the most reliable test of drum stock, I was told, was the sniff test. <laughs> and I didn't believe that uh, until I smelt my first drum of contaminated fuel. Smells like rotten cabbages. I was told that these drums of fuel were delivered by the local uh, training ships and they were just dumped overboard and floated ashore. So when I look back on it, uh, a pretty good time doing travelling engineers' duties in, in, with Fiji Airways. The, the duties were different on the HS 748, uh, not the same, we actually had a hostess. Um, and I have a couple of stories about the two trips I did on that, but that's some other time. But for, for you um, World War II history buffs, we've included some photographs of the Japanese heavy guns on Show Island in Tarawa and from a historic point of view this island was the scene of one of the um, first American marine invasions in the South Pacific. 
Tara was a British possession prior to World War II, and the Japanese invaded in 42. And they established a base there, including an airfield on Basho Island, which is the slide that's up now. And the, the Americans mounted a massive invasion to take the island from the 20th to the 23rd of November in 1943. Uh, and the engagement lasted 76 hours and resulted in massive loss of life, totaling 6,386 killed. Most of those were Japanese and Korean uh, laborers, 4,690 of them. The Americans lost uh, 1,606 men and another um, 2,101 wounded. There were only 17 Japanese soldiers and 129 Korean laborers captured alive by the Americans. I only actually had the one brief um, visit to Beishou Island in, in 67, and the large concrete bunker that's up there now, I, I understand that to have been the Japanese command post. I didn't notice the four 8-inch naval guns around the island, but I do remember hearing them referred to as the Singaporean guns, as it was believed they'd been the British guns from Singapore repositioned by the Japanese. However, a United Nations uh, official examined the guns in 1974 and noted their serial numbers, and they were later identified with the help of Vickers UK as part of an order supplied to Japan in 1905 uh, during the, the Russian-Japanese War. And there's, uh, it's going to say there's much information available on the internet to those who are interested in the war in the Pacific, uh, particularly the Battle of Tarawa. Uh, there's lots of details and maps and I actually found a, uh, a report by uh, from the Japanese point of view of the of the battle. So, thank you.